Welcome to the world of Mark's Money Mind, coming to you from the Rocky Mountain town of Crested Butte, Colorado. I am your host, Mark Troutman, CFP. This educational, personal finance show combines money lessons, timely topics, personal stories, and community wisdom to help listeners and viewers master their finances to enjoy a stress-free life of financial freedom. Hello, everybody. A quick housing update before I dive into today's topic. Today, I closed on the sale of my house. Yay. All done there. And I'm fully moved into my accessory dwelling unit in Crested Butte. And ADU is basically an apartment. And in my case, it's over a garage. So if you are watching on YouTube, you will notice quite a different backdrop. This is the living slash kitchen area of my apartment. This will be the backdrop, at least until I get a new place in Longmont, which I will talk about in a moment. Or while I'm traveling, I will likely have many different backdrops and I have some big travels coming up soon. I would like to have a shout out to my daughter, Katie, and her friend, Jessica, who helped me move into here and organize everything this past weekend. So thank you very much for helping me with that. And also to Kevin Sebesta, who helped me move all of my possessions to Longmont's last weekend in a U-Haul. And Mason for helping me load up the truck. We were able to load all of my remaining possessions, which weren't very many, in about three hours. And that's just because you're playing Tetris in the truck. And then Kevin and I drove the truck to Longmont and our friend Victor in Longmont helped us unload it. And we got it done in just over an hour and a half. So that was fun and had enough time to go to the potluck at the Mr. Money Mustache headquarters in Longmont. And I'm looking forward to doing a lot of those potlucks in the future. Kevin and I both stayed there for a couple of days before we went to a concert in Red Rocks. We went to see Get the Let Out. It was an awesome concert. Highly recommend seeing that band if you get a chance. And certainly if you can see them at Red Rocks, all the better. And that day, that morning, actually, or actually the day before the show, I had seen a house online that I was interested in. And my friend Mindy Jensen from Bigger Pockets and also the Mindy on Money podcast is also a realtor. And she's been helping me look at houses in Longmont. And there was a new build community that I was interested in. And we walked through a house that is partially finished. And I put an offer on it and it was accepted. So I am under contract for a new house in Longmont. So a lot of things were happening in this past week. And I'm looking forward to that. The projected Finish date for that property is sometime this fall, most likely while I'm away on my big international trip to Bali for the Five Freedom Retreat and Australia and New Zealand afterwards. So that's what's going on with me. New digs. Obviously, the podcasting equipment is working good, so I was able to set that all up. So that's great. And so for today's show, I was thinking about I read the news, I read the Wall Street Journal every day, and something interesting happened last week. The Federal Reserve lowered interest rates for the first time in many years. What did they do? They lowered rates by 50 basis points, which is one half of 1%. What the heck does that mean? So I thought we would go through what the Federal Reserve does a little bit, talk about the yield curve, and talk about the effect on interest rates and the economy and things like that. Let me back up for a moment and talk about the Federal Reserve's primary mandate. So the Federal Reserve meets, I think it's every month mostly, and they have a discussion. There's a board of the Federal Reserve, and they discuss interest rates and the economy and inflation and employment and all of those things. And they set monetary policy to help guide the economy and interest rates with their kind of blunt tool. So their key mandates, they have two of them. One is to promote maximum employment, and the other is to have stability in prices, i.e. keep inflation under control. And they attempt to do this by setting monetary policy. And what they do is Their primary tool is 
influencing short-term interest rates by raising or lowering its target rate, which is called the Fed funds rate. And the Fed funds rate is an interest rate for overnight borrowing for banks. And then by changing these rates, it kind of reverberates throughout the economy. I won't get in too deep into it. I could go spend a long time on exactly what it is. I'll actually link in the show notes that Federal Reserve put out a pretty good little blurb on who they are, what they do, and how it works. So I will link to that. So these changes in the federal funds rate normally affects and influences other interest rates and the financial conditions in the economy as a result, although it typically does it with a lag effect. It can take some time for increases in interest rates to slow the economy or decreases in interest rates to boost the economy. So it's a pretty blunt tool so they aren't able to just target in on things and make things happen. They kind of have to do their best to get the economy going where they want or inflation under control. And you may recall that inflation heated up in early 2022 after the economy reopened post-COVID. And to combat this, the Fed raised interest rates. So the Fed is basically short for the Federal Reserve. The Fed raised interest rates significantly. So they had dropped them to 0%, basically down to zero, to stimulate the economy because of COVID. Then once we started getting out of the COVID period and the economy started to improve, inflation started to bubble up. And the Fed and many people were worried that inflation could run away. So they significantly raised rates over the course of a little over a year from 0% to 5.5%. You saw things like money market rates go up, savings rates go up. But the goal was to slow down inflation. If you increase rates, it typically will slow the economy and thus decrease or at least stifle inflation. That brings us to today. So recently, inflation has shown signs of cooling. We don't have the crazy inflation that we saw immediately after the end of, I can't say the end of COVID, but when the economy started to improve after things started opening up again. But recent signs are that inflation has been subdued to some degree. And then the question is, well, so you think of the Fed's interest rate stance as like putting the brakes on. So they put the brakes on by raising rates, trying to slow the economy. And then the risk is, if you leave rates too high too long, you may over slow the economy and push it into a recession. So that's the risk of keeping rates high. So then there's this kind of balancing point where the Fed has to decide when do we start lowering rates to kind of ease off the brakes to make the economy go quicker. And if they lower rates too quickly, well, that could cause inflation to come back. If they don't lower rates quick enough, it could cause a recession. So it's kind of this balancing act. Recently, inflation has shown signs of easing, like I said, And economic growth has shown some signs of cooling. So the Fed has decided to shift gears and ease off the brakes to hopefully assist the economy in avoiding a recession. And that's the hope, at least. So that also brings up the concept of the yield curve. Well, what the heck is a yield curve? Simply, the yield curve is a graph of interest rates, typically treasury obligations, treasury bills, treasury notes, treasury bonds. And I will link to a really good website that you can see today's yield curve and you can go back in time and see it from other periods. You can compare yield curves over time and things like that. It's a free site. And so the graph, think of a graph as there's a vertical line and a horizontal line, and then you're plotting dots across this graph. So the horizontal axis is maturity date. And typically, well, on this one that I'll link to, you'll see one month, two month, three month, four month, six month, one year, two year, three year, five year, seven year, 10 year, 20 year, and 30 year. And those are all maturity dates for treasuries that you can buy from the treasury. And then on the vertical axis, you have the current yield for those obligations or rate. 
And a dot is placed at each maturity. So the one month dot would be at whatever the current yield is for the one month bill, for example, and the same for, let's say, the 10 year. So the 10 year, you would plot the dot wherever the yield is for the 10 year currently. And then you will see you can connect these dots in a line and you can get a shape for the curve. So let's talk about that a little bit. There are three primary shapes to the curve and they kind of have a meaning. They usually are a signal as to where investors feel the economy is currently and going. And there are three basic shapes. The first one is kind of the normal yield curve, which is a positive slope. So it slopes from left to right in an upward fashion. Then there's flat and there's inverted where it slopes downward. And flat is basically where all the rates are relatively the same. Lower yields are typically associated with shorter maturities and higher yields are typically associated with longer maturities, which means that the curve is normally upward sloping or a normal curve. And in that case, the economy is typically growing and investors anticipate some inflation, therefore requiring more compensation for longer maturities. So that's kind of what you would normally see in growth environment, a little bit of inflation. People want to be compensated for a longer maturity because of some inflationary aspects to their holding period. Now, currently, primarily as a result of the Fed's aggressive tightening over the past few years, they've been raising rates. And again, their tool is the short end of the curve, overnight rates. So the yield curve is currently inverted. Shorter rates are higher than intermediate term and longer term rates. This is usually a sign that investors anticipate a slowing economy. If the economy slows, often rates will fall and bond market yields are telegraphing that. Frequently, an inverted curve is also an indicator of a recession, but not always. And the curve has been inverted for quite a while now. People have been seeing this inverted yield curve and saying a recession is potentially on the horizon because typically an in recession is preceded by an inverted yield curve, but not always. And then just so we can discuss what a flat yield curve is, it's usually just the transition from the yield curve going from positive to inverted or vice versa. What does it mean when the Fed lowers rates via the Fed funds rate targeting mechanism. Right now, they're hoping to lower rates enough so that the economy doesn't go into recession, but has what is often referred to as a soft landing, which basically means inflation has subsided, but a recession doesn't occur. Maybe growth slows, but it doesn't go negative. Typically, two quarters of negative growth are the definition of a recession. And it's a really tough task with such a blunt tool. So it's not something that is frequently accomplished. Often the Fed overshoots in either direction. The other thing to think about is, so we have this inverted yield curve and if it goes back to a positive shape, that would be normal then but it may only be because short-term rates drop, not necessarily because long-term rates drop less, let's say, or even move at all. And they may even move up, but they don't have to move up. So the Fed is really affecting the short end of the curve. So the real interesting thing to watch will be, do we go into a situation where we're back into a normal curve where it's sloping from left to right in an upward fashion? And if so, how does it accomplish that? Is it just the short end coming down? Do longer term rates go up? And the reason that's important is because many loan rates are set not off of the short term rate, like the Fed funds rate, but intermediate term rates. However, what we can expect right now is that money market rates, which are usually invested in things like zero to 30 or even 60 day maturity items, you will see those likely fall pretty quickly. 
Same with savings accounts. Savings account rates typically go up slower than the federal funds rate because the banks try not to increase rates. They don't have to when the Fed is raising rates. So there's usually a lag there. But when rates come down, they usually come down pretty quickly on the savings rate side. So you will probably see lower rates on your savings accounts or certainly like online savings accounts, which are pretty sensitive to federal funds rates. Your credit card rates will also drop. Now, hopefully no one is borrowing money on credit cards or you know that everyone is paying their bills in full every month and it won't affect you. But if you look at your statement, you will probably see that those credit card rates will also fall because they tend to follow the action in the federal funds market. So you can expect lower rates for those instruments. However, mortgage rates are more influenced by intermediate term treasuries, really. And there's a spread over treasuries. And they typically are influenced in that kind of 10-year area of the yield curve. So the 10-year treasury right now is about 3.75%. I've not looked at mortgage rates recently, but I think they're around six to six and a half. So that's what a two to two and a quarter spread over 10-year treasury seems about right. You're hearing that the Fed is lowering rates by 50 basis points or half a percent last week. That doesn't mean that mortgage rates will necessarily follow. Typically what happens is the Fed will lower rates a quarter of a point at a time. They did do a half a point or half a percent this time. And I think they just felt like maybe they were a little behind the curve. The other thing that the Fed kind of has a little bit of a challenge with right now is that frequently or often, the Fed doesn't like to make interest rate changes during an election period, presidential election period. So maybe they were trying to get ahead a little bit and do two quarter point cuts at once and half a percent, or maybe they felt like they were a little behind. Who knows what their reasoning is, but they often will telegraph that they are making changes in interest rates and they do it slowly and methodically. So in most cases, they're not just cutting once and calling it a day. They usually are cutting and then they do it pretty frequently over the course of the next several meetings that they have. So let's say the Fed ultimately lowers rates by, let's say, two to three percentage points. And this is just speculation. It's not, I'm not projecting it. I have no clue as to what the Fed's going to do, but let's just say it's two or 3%. That doesn't mean that mortgage rates will come down by two or two to 3%. You may actually have the 10 year treasury remain relatively stable. It's already pretty low at 3.75. So it may be just that we see short-term rates come down. So that means your savings rates, money market rates, things like that will come down, but maybe mortgage rates don't come down very much, if at all. They may even go up because if rates are cut too quickly, let's say, and the economy starts to show some rapid growth, for example, then the bond market or investors in the bond market are going to anticipate inflation in the future during those terms. Let's say they have a five-year or 10-year treasury, they're saying, hey, if inflation is going to be 2 or 3 or 4% over my holding period, I need to be compensated for that. So therefore, those rates need to potentially even go up. So it's not a given that just because the Fed is cutting rates, that mortgage rates will fall. They might, and they might not. So it will really be interesting to see how this all unfolds. And if the economy can avoid a recession that the yield curve is kind of telegraphing at this point, but again, doesn't always mean there's going to be a recession, but recessions are typically preceded by an inverted yield curve. And we've had an inverted yield curve for quite a while now, and we have not had a recession. So maybe we get away without having a recession, or maybe there's a recession on the horizon. Who knows? No one knows. No one has a crystal ball. But it will be interesting to watch. It will also be interesting to see if the curve's shape goes from inverted to positive or flat. It's kind of flattening now. It is getting a little flatter. And 
the Fed often overshoots, like I said, in both directions. So maybe they overshot when they raised rates and maybe they'll overshoot when they lower rates. And this elusive soft landing may or may not happen. It'll be very interesting to watch. So grab the popcorn and I'll keep you posted. We'll see what happens. It's going to be a long time. This usually takes a while for this to you know, unfold. But we will see. I get a lot of questions from people just in general about what is the yield curve? How do interest rates work? What does it mean when the Fed lowers rates? So I just hope this was an informational episode to help us all think a little bit more about how all this stuff works. And like I said, it will be interesting to watch and we will see what happens. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you for listening to this week's show. Please click follow on your favorite podcast player or subscribe on YouTube to ensure you don't miss any future episodes. Also, please leave a rating and review for the show. This helps improve the ranking and enables other like-minded people find the content in their podcast players. If you would like me to answer a question on the show, please send it to mark at marksmoneymind.com and put podcast question in the subject line. Let me know your first name or let me know if you would like to remain anonymous and also your state of residence if you choose. I would also appreciate it if you would recommend this show to friends and family that might benefit from this content. See you next week on the Mark's Money Mind Show. Until then, make some, save and invest, live on the rest. And now for the all-important disclaimer. This show is for education and entertainment purposes only and should not be considered investment, tax, or legal advice. Please consult the appropriate advisor or advisors before implementing anything you hear on this show or any other show for that matter. While I fully intend for everything on this show to be true and accurate at the time of each recording, occasionally errors may occur. So please do your own due diligence on anything discussed.